of sessions on technology powering payments policy implications and real world practice of digital payments in today's session we have uh, renuka kumar of university of michigan uh, who will be presenting on her paper titled security analysis of unified payment interface and payment apps in india which did a detailed security analysis of upi protocol by reverse engineering the design of this protocol and through seven popular upi apps and discovered uh, previously unreported multi factor authentication design level flaws uh, in the upi 1.0 specification they also had reported multiple cves uh, we'll uh, have the talk by renuka first and then we'll have uh, anand venkat narayan and abhay rana discuss the paper followed by an audience q and a uh, audience q and a will be with renuka and her co-authors uh, shrish kishore and professor atul prakash uh, people joining via zoom are requested to post their questions on the q and a section uh, people joining on uh, via youtube can use the chat section we'll have them answered here uh, please keep your question limited to the context of the paper being discussed uh, and in case if you are planning to write about the paper please get in touch with renuka to avoid uh, misinterpreting or misrecording her work over to you renuka all right uh, thank you shrikant for uh, having us here and uh, giving us this forum to share our work and i'm ex extremely excited to see the uh, earnestness that we all share in uh, you know seeing mobile uh, you know uh, payments grow securely in india so i'll just share my screen right now uh, so i can share the presentation with you all can you see it uh, shrikant yep okay so i'll first uh, go into the talk and uh, we'll be happy to take questions uh, in the end so this research um, started in 2017 after beam was released and it was a collaboration with uh, professor prakash and my colleagues uh, sreesh and haulu sreesh was a primary point of contact for this work for me in india so we all know that india was predominantly a cash based economy and while payment apps existed they were not that popular early indian payment apps were digital wallets which meant that from a user standpoint for two users wanting to do a transaction would have to install the exact same app add money to the wallet and the payment service provider would do a wallet to wallet transaction sometimes for a nominal fee now um, this was a story until 2016 in 2016 the national payments corporation of india or npci launched the unified payments interface to facilitate date free and instant micro payments from a mobile platform now the upi is nothing but a common back end infrastructure that facilitated bank to bank transactions from a, a user standpoint for two users wanting to do a transaction can now install any one of the upi enabled apps and simply add their bank account to it now uh, upi has seen a tremendous amount of success and as of june 2020 there are 155 banks live on upi that has carried out 1.3 billion transactions worth 34 billion us dollars so my research is in this research like we conduct a security analysis of the multi factor authentication workflow of upi 1.0 which is basically a complex black box application layer protocol used by several indian payment apps and its design choices now uh, npci has published a few broad guidelines on uh, upi first off uh, for a user wanting to use uh, upi the user's primary cell number must be registered with the bank out of band um npci also stipulates three factors of authentication the first factor is called as a device fingerprint which is nothing but an association between the cell number and the device information and this association at the server side is called as device hard binding now npci calls this the most security critical part of the protocol the second factor is the passcode which is an optional parameter the first two factors are used for user profile setup or user registration and the third factor which is a upi pin is used to authorize transactions um setting a upi pin requires six digits of the debit card number and expiration date basically these are details that's printed on the card 
Now, when we started this research, this is all we knew about the protocol as such. So as a result, the objective of our analysis was to uncover the details of the client server handshake that happened between a UPI app and the UPI server and to collect from each step of the protocol, what were the credentials that, that was required for that step and were there any uh, user specific attributes that were leaked. We also wanted to see if there were any alternate workflows which we could exploit. Finally, we uh, triaged our findings to determine plausible attack vectors. Now, there were two significant reverse engineering barriers that we had to overcome in this process. First off, the UPI protocol itself was unpublished and which meant we had no backend access to UPI servers. Hence, we, we resorted to analyzing the protocol through the lens of a few of the popular UPI apps. But that said, these apps had several layers of defense in them and they were pretty much designed with a lot of security in mind. So evading these app defenses was non-trivial. For instance, all these apps were obfuscated. They used encrypted communication. They could detect the presence of a rooted phone. Uh, they could detect the presence of an emulator and also required a physical SIM card to be present on the phone, which effectively made dynamic analysis very hard. So depending on the app, we choose a combination of static reversing, code instrumentation and traffic analysis. Now for this work, we first chose Beam for our analysis because Beam was India's flagship app and also the reference implementation of a UPI app. We started with version 1.3 of the app. To understand and extract the details, we actually instrumented the app and repackaged the app so that we could map the GUI of the app with the underlying uh, traffic it generated. We confirmed our findings on other popular UPI 1.0 apps and we chose the Android flavors of these apps because Android was the most popular uh, operating system in India. In the next set of slides, we will gloss over the details of the UPI 1.0 handshake from attacker perspective. And essentially, um, the goal of the attacker here is to compromise an existing user's Beam account on the attacker's device. And this attack will equally work for a new user or a non-user of UPI. We assume the following threat model. We assume any good user that installs Beam from Google Play Store and uses a properly configured phone. The user is also uh, selfish and prevents unauthorized access to the phone by untrusted parties. And we represent the user as a green phone in the following slides. And we also assume an attacker that uses a rooted phone and can essentially reverse engineer any of the apps, okay? The attacker also releases a rather useful but unprivileged Trojan app, which we call Mali, that somehow makes its way to the uh, you know, victim's phone. And we re represent the attacker as a black phone with the devil on top. Now, for the attack to succeed, uh, uh, we assume that the victim must have Mali installed. Now, the question is, is this threat model realistic? Now, according to Google, threat because of PHAs or potentially harmful applications are very real. Google statistics show that 53% of the attacks are because of PHAs pre-installed on cell phones and India is in the top three countries with the most number of PHAs pre-installed. That said, for an attacker that does not want to use Mali can simply resort to social engineering attacks. And what you see on top is, uh, is the uh, victim's device with Mali in it. We next look at how to attack the user profile workflow, workflow or the user registration workflow, essentially by compromising the device fingerprint and the passcode. We first uh, detail the device hard binding workflow, the default workflow that happens in UPI. And then we peel through each layer of the protocol and examine from an attacker perspective how an attacker can essentially compromise the workflow to finally launch an attack on an existing user. On the left is the Beam uh, uh, client and on the right is the UPI server. 
The Beam client on a user's device first grabs the user's device details and sends it to the UPI server. The UPI server saves the device information and sends a registration token back to the client. How does this look under the hood? On the left is a screenshot of the GUI that generates the traffic and on the right is the UPI server. The client app first sends the device ID, OS, version, manufacturer and model in UPI 1.0 to the UPI server and the server returns the registration token. Subsequently, Beam app on the user's device automatically reads a user's cell phone from the device and sends an SMS containing the registration token to the UPI server. Now, what you see here on the right is a Beam app that presents the user a list of SIM cards to choose from. And once the user makes his choice, the registration token is sent to the UPI server as an SMS and the Beam client waits for an SMS delivery confirmation from the UPI server. Subsequently, the UPI server verifies the cell number that it received from the, as the SMS, and it then sends a uh, device binding successful message to Beam client. So what you see here is that once the uh, SMS delivery confirmation is obtained, the client actually sends an HTTP GET request to verify the binding to the UPI server. And the UPI server returns a message that says that the binding is actually successful. And this account is the account of a new user. And he indicates that by setting a flag called user account exists. Now let's examine the same workflow from an attacker perspective. From an attacker standpoint, this step two of the protocol is inherently more secure than a traditional OTP based verification because for an attacker to verify step two, attacker to compromise step two of the protocol, attacker has to essentially compromise the protections provided by the cell phone company. So initially we were stumped at this point, but we later found out that UPI has an alternate workflow that gets triggered when step two, which is a send SMS step of the protocol, actually fails. This failure can be induced by either putting the device in airplane mode or having, the, having a phone with insufficient SMS balance, and we have tried both. In the alternate workflow, what happens at that point is that the attacker is prompted with a screen to enter a cell number. An attacker can simply choose to enter a victim cell number to essentially bind the attacker's device to a victim's phone. This cell number that is entered is sent as a HTTP message along with the token to the UPI server. What you see here on the right is the uh, client screen for entering the cell number. The cell number with the token is sent as HTTP message to UPI server. And the UPI server now sends an SMS based OTP to the client. Essentially, to break the device binding, now because the UPI server sends the OTP to the victim and not the attacker, the attacker needs some means to leak the OTP. Now, there's, a, there's two ways that he can do this one and the obvious ways to do social engineering. All right. Or what we do in, in our case is that we have Mali with receive SMS permissions that can intercept the OTP and this OTP is forwarded to the attacker. At this point, device binding is essentially compromised. Thus, to break device binding, all the attacker requires is a user's cell number and one OTP from that number. And if you think about it from a new user or a non-user's perspective, this essentially compromises the entire user profile setup because the next step, which is to set a passcode, an attacker can simply set a passcode on behalf of the user. So to set the passcode, once the device binding is successful, the attacker can simply enter an attacker control password, at which point the UPI server will prompt the attacker to add a bank account. It is imperative to note here that the passcode that is requested is not a secret that's shared with the payment server or the bank. 
which means that for third party apps like google pay the passcode is a secret that it shares with the google payment server and not the bank or upi this means that an attacker can essentially use an attacker controlled account to bypass the passcode pa the passcode step of the protocol to add a bank account an attacker can simply uh, brute force through the list of banks that upi provides at that time the upi server appear to allow brute force attacks and the attacker can simply start by brute forcing with the most popular banks once the attacker has chosen the right bank the upi server returns the bank account information to the client this essentially means that at this point the upi server reveal sensitive information of a user without the user actually providing any bank specific secrets so note that at no point in the workflow until now is the attacker ever prompted to enter a bank specific secret of a victim now how does this look like for an existing user for an existing user the attacker will have to leak the passcode that's set by the user our paper talks about a couple of approaches but one approach that we had taken at that time was to use an overlay on beams passcode entry screen which required no additional permissions on behalf of mali so uh, once mali intercepts the passcode the passcode is forwarded to the attacker the attacker then sends a passcode to the upi server and the upi server for an existing user returns the user's bank information thus an attacker can sync an existing user's bank account without providing any bank specific secrets let's now see a demo of an attack on an existing user a few preconditions for the attack we as an attacker we disable uh beams client side defenses and installed a repackaged version of beam on the attacker's device we assume that the victim's device is already compromised with mali now for the attack to start the attacker must first learn of a user's cell number now uh the paper talks about a way you can do this starting with no knowledge of a user but that said a cell number is not really a secret in india and it's widely circulated Let's just quickly see the attack now. On the right side is the user's device or the victim's device, and on the left side is the attacker device. The victim enters the passcode. The Trojan running on the victim's phone intercepts the passcode. The victim is an already existing user of Beam and has got his ICICI account added to the uh, Beam app. what you see in the background uh, is the trojan app what you'll see soon so that's the trojan app now the attacker uses the repackaged version of beam and is setting up beam for the very first time beam allows the attacker to choose a sim of his choice and once the attacker chooses his sim the sms is sent with the token to the upi server essentially in this case that step of the workflow will fail it's going to finish soon and once the sms fails the attacker is prompted to enter the sms has failed the attacker has will be prompted to enter the victim's uh, cell number i am asking the cell number here for privacy concerns once the cell number is entered the attacker will now wait for the otp to be forwarded from the victim so essentially the upi server sends the otp to the victim's device which mali intercepts and mali will forward the passcode and the otp to the attacker's phone
that's the OTP. You should see the attacker receive the OTP on the left. That's the OTP, at which point the mobile is automatically verified because we have the client side defenses uh, you know, disabled. And what you see here is the OTP and the passcode. At this point, all the attacker has to do is to enter the passcode. Attacker keys in the passcode. And the attacker will be able to see the victim's ICICI bank account on the attacker's phone. That's the bank account on the attacker's phone. Okay, so at this point, technically the attacker has compromised the user's uh, registration workflow, but the attacker is still not able to do a transaction. Now to do a transaction, the attacker will require UPI pin. And what we found at that time was that the UPI pin could be leaked the exact same way as the passcode could be leaked. But that said, setting a UPI pin requires only the partial debit card information printed on the card. In contrast, transactions in India using a debit card requires a complete card number along with a secret pin that's shared with the bank. And for UPI, requiring a the printed, the printed information is uh, definitely a lower bar in India. So what's the damage? Unlike mobile wallets where money may be lost or stolen from the wallet, here the attacker can completely empty a user's bank account. Now the question is, has this been exploited yet? We have seen a lot of reports regarding hacks on uh, UPI apps, but you know, but what we are not clear about are the timelines and the details on the UPI version that led to a compromise and still a speculation for us what the details are of those attacks. We did a responsible disclosure of the UPI 1.2 vulnerabilities to certain and NCIIPC in June and in October of 2017. And uh, we waited, we withheld the publication because we didn't have a tangible response from them. So we went ahead and filed for CVEs with CERT US and we got the following, the four following CVEs. We also re reported all the PII leaks that we found in payment apps to the respective app vendors. And uh, we, ent we went ahead and got CVEs for that as well. We also got a 5K bounty from Samsung for the same. UPI 2.2 was released in August, 2018. And we confirmed that NPCI you know, did address the weak device binding mechanism that we used for our exploit. Essentially, the alternate workflow, OTP-based verification workflow that was there in the 1.0 design was removed. But the other pitfalls still remain, including the sensitive bank uh, leak to the client. So we are currently uh, in the process of exploring uh, UPI 2.0, but we have not found any exploits as yet. But I quickly want to show you a, a packet capture of uh, you know, the UPI handshake as seen through Paytm. What you see here is the device details that sent to the UPI server as it stands, uh, you know, as we got it, I think July 2019, not today, July 2019. Uh, the device details sent includes the user's location, network type, IMEI number, SIM number, and essentially UPI seems to be collecting more device details in 2.2 possibly to make the device binding more secure. And what we see here is that when the uh, user is verified, the user profile step of the handshake actually returns the complete banking information in the clear to the client. So what this means essentially is that the account number and the banking details of a user is potentially available to a third party service provider. and if this third party service provider for, for whatever reason is compromised, we don't know what the implications are of that. There are 155 UPI apps and an attacker can use any one of the apps to leak the information. We did a disclosure of the PII leak to CERT India in December 29, 2018, uh, but we didn't hear back 
uh, from them. So uh, recently, after USNICs, NPCI has reached out to us in August 2020, and we are in the process of discussing the vulnerabilities with them. We have also notified to them the concerns regarding the bank account number, uh, which is returned to the client without having to provide banking credentials. And NPCI has also acknowledged the UPI 1.0 vulnerability, and uh, apparently they had already fixed this in October 2017, which we were not aware of due to a lag in the process, reporting process. So finally, to wrap up the talk, a few key takeaways. NPCI relies on um, security by obscurity in their design of the protocol, and it's rather concerning because in the event of a compromise or an incident, uh, we don't know what to how to assess. The assumptions are rather unclear. So does NPCI rely on server-side security or client-side security or a combination of both? Uh, it's essential that we factor in uh, the limitations of Android and the nuances that happen as a result of user behavior into the design of a, uh, you know, uh, such a pervasive protocol. And uh, the, th the third point, um, uh, UPI had added uh, the alternate workflow as a feature, if you remember right in 1.2, but the OTP based workflows are well known to be compromisable. And what we see is that uh, a lot of the payment app vendors even now rely on workflows that use OTP. UPI 2.2 seems to address that and appears to require send SMS, which is definitely better than uh, OTP based verification that we see in uh, 1.0. Uh, it definitely makes the attack harder. But that said, security is a moving target and concerns remain. Uh, for instance, uh, like we mentioned earlier, any of the apps could be reverse engineered or the attacker could simply resort to a SIM fraud or essentially uh, the third party server could have bugs that could be exploited or compromised, which we saw, for instance, in a recent you know, data breach uh, uh, of Beam accounts. So that said, um, we call for a proper security vetting of the protocol, uh, given that NPCI plans to you know, make UPI global. Um, and that's it, I, thank you. Thanks, Shinika. Uh, now we will have uh, Abe Rana uh, for his comments. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, this was really interesting. Uh, I've been uh, following along your research previously as well. Uh, it was published. Uh, thanks, I think, to Srikanth uh, for highlighting it. Uh, uh, so since uh, uh, I had a few questions first on the uh, submission process itself, uh, how was uh, the NBC response in terms of uh, fixing these issues or uh, respond, responding responsibly to uh... um, So, so uh, I think at the time we disclosed the vulnerabilities, we didn't actually hear back. So we got a, a acknowledgement to the email from certain India. The certain India did acknowledge that they received our email. Uh, we did not hear back from NPCI. And then I think the step two attempt, we, I reached out to uh, this NCII PC body, like, uh, you know, uh, and um, uh, that was pretty much at that time, no response. So, uh, so which is why we, we withheld the publication until we could ascertain that the, you know, vulnerabilities were actually addressed. Um, and you mentioned the level of PI information that is accessible currently to both PSPs as well as uh, the amount of PI information that is accessible with just a single uh, SMS, essentially, even after the uh, OTP fix. Uh, I currently, for example, just need to send an SMS from a device to get access to your current bank account information and uh, other information, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, any implications, like uh, real life implications for these attacks? If, for example, an attacker gets access to my banking information. Uh, so, uh, simple thing the... to... Yeah, go ahead. Not the... That's it. Actually, you got, uh, I think you broke up a bit. Yeah, Nemo, your voice so, is breaking a bit. Sorry. Uh, 
my internet connection is finicky today. But yeah, uh, my question was, uh, if we just consider the first half of the attack and uh, ignore the UPA pin itself, as you mentioned, uh, where I'm able to, uh, the attacker, by either receiving the SMS or sending the SMS uh, as part of breaking the device binding process, I get access to, uh, for example, the background information of the customer or maybe the transaction information as well. Uh, uh, what are the potential implications of this? Uh, for example, like if I don't have the ability to empty out the bank account, what can we do? So, uh, so essentially, if you think about it, the uh, there's one altered workflow in Beam uh, that allows you to reset the passcode using a user's bank account number. So, if the attacker does not know the bank account information, essentially there is a channel within the app itself that could potentially give the attacker a way to uh, get that information. So it, it makes the passcode step, it, it, it's potentially a, you know, a loophole there to uh, uh, bypass the passcode based authentication in Beam, for instance. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, it, it allows automatability. Like it, it, you don't have to rely on too much of social engineering essentially, but you could find the information from the app itself is what I was thinking. Right. Uh... And I had a question on the, uh, you mentioned issues with Samsung uh, Pay itself. Uh, was Samsung Pay evaluated as part of the UPA protocol here or was something else? I'm not sure. No, it was something else. It was actually a, you know, a, a debit card leak. So that's the other thing. So in the, most of these apps, if you look at it, uh, I don't want to quote any names. A lot of these apps allowed leaks of uh, personal information, card numbers, other card numbers, driver's license information. And some of this information can also facilitate you know, bypassing the KYC process for an attacker, for instance. Uh, so, so we had reported a whole bunch of those leaks to a lot of the app vendors and Samsung was, uh, did request us to withhold a public disclosure until they addressed it. So they were very you know, respectful of the process. Thanks. Uh, and uh, since you've mentioned uh, there are 155 different applications, uh, and each, uh, did you, and uh, uh, among the apps that you worked with, uh, was the device binding process itself vastly different or slightly different? Or what's the uh, variance between the apps themselves in terms of? Like so, you, yeah, UPL uses a common library. So, most of these apps, at least what we saw, had the similar process. The URLs in some cases, for example, Paytm, I think the way it's routed is probably different. So, the URLs in some cases appear different. For some apps, we could not capture the network flow because uh, Google Pay, for instance, you know, has uh, SSL pinning. So we could not bypass the network flow in, in essentially capture the clear text traffic. So, but I think uh, in, in at least in 1.0, because the library is the same, most of these you know, uh, apps had a similar process. Certain apps do collect a little bit more information, which I think is not necessarily for UPI. It could be for the app, you know, third-party vendor itself. So I don't know, for instance, in the Paytm uh, dump I showed you, how much of that is used for pay is for Paytm versus how much of that UPI requires. So that is still a black box to us. We don't know that as much. But at least in the earlier versions of the app, we did see a lot of patterns, similar patterns. I think I, you mentioned how the uh, the design level assumptions that UPI takes are not published or documented anywhere in terms of. Uh, what's the threat model here, or what's the assumptions that uh, an attacker has, or what's the uh, design guidelines that are being followed in this case. Uh, next, uh, Srikant, back to you. Okay. Uh, Aran, you want to go next? Yeah. Uh, so, Renika, one of the things that uh, I was looking at um, your paper, uh, it is clear to me that uh, device binding, you have a problem in general with the device binding, the way in which it is done, isn't that right? And, and most of the source of issues come because of the device binding process. Uh, so I, I had a, I don't, I mean, actually let me think about it. And uh, the thing is the device binding in the, as an OTP, the OTP based approach device binding, I, I do not agree to that process at all, essentially somewhere. But I was thinking about this and I realized that if assume that device binding did not exist at all, then it's it's a cakewalk for the attacker. So there's a certain layer of protection. I think the binding process gives an attacker, but I think the assumptions there, I don't somewhere agree with because the protocol assumes that the possession of a device means the user is correct somewhere. 
So they, they, they think of the user as the device itself essentially somewhere and, um, and SM, I don't know whether, I mean, is SMS based uh, device binding mechanism sturdy enough needs is questionable. So the, not having the binding process itself, I think makes it very easy for an attacker. Okay. So, now I'll ask a different uh, question because uh, mm -hmm. I've been investigating about uh, close to 7,000 uh, odd uh, phishing attacks that have been happening as a, mm -hmm. as a large data set across uh, the last year. And uh, one of the things that it actually comes to me very clearly uh, is that uh, irrespective of the uh, educational background, uh, people keep uh, falling uh, for uh, the phishing attacks. Okay, right. and, and I can see a process uh, uh, almost like a script uh, that we have kind of analyzed about how a fissure works. And the first thing that we noticed uh, is that uh, everyone uh, calls a mobile number first. Okay, and uh, mobile numbers are not a secret in India as you rightly pointed out, uh, but it so happens that people almost can make a guess whether a bank account is attached to a mobile account or not. Uh, by going to some of the banks which allow OTP uh, mobile based login. Okay. So, for instance, recently we saw uh, about three or four days back uh, about uh, uh, a bunch of scammers who were using uh, ICICIbank.com to do a mobile number login. They basically get a list. So, if you look at what has happened uh, on the phishing side, is uh, we see a portfolio management kind of an attack. It's, it's, it's getting pretty sophisticated. So you have a spammers network and uh, they basically get a uh, thousand mobile numbers in one bunch, okay? And every mobile number becomes like a project, right? So it's like a project state. Uh, mobile number A obtained, mobile number B, uh, check on icicabank.com, uh, check on sba.com, a whole bunch of things using uh, uh, whether the bank account is connected to it and then call people and then there is a script and then at the end of it, the script branches out into four or five different flow charts and diagrams. I mean, at the end of it, when it comes to it, comes Beam and all of these attacks. So what they actually do is uh, the device binding process itself uh, is basically an attack vector for the scammers, uh, where they basically walk through it. And of course, you can come and say phishing is a very common uh, thing. People have to protect against it. I don't see any evidence uh, from the data set that I see that educational background makes a difference. People still don't get the fact uh, that a different kind of an OTP means something, another different kind of an OTP means something. Uh, and having said that, uh, there is another set of attacks that, so if you look at from a scammers, what they basically do is uh, 140 mobile phones obtained this week. Uh, the group leader basically is a project manager sitting in Noida. Okay, I can even tell that to you. And he basically draws a nice little Kanban board I, I, I'm actually seeing about a Kanban board where he walks through all the 140 and then at the end of it, he basically gets a list of 40 and then the script runs and then you basically get a success of like five or six. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's basically like a portfolio management approach uh, towards a, a phishing attack. It's pretty effective and a deadly effective. And most of it is based on uh, calling the person and giving them some information about their bank. Uh, some information about, uh, and, and bank enumeration doesn't work the way in which you say it. Bank enumeration works by logging into like four or five of these banks and common banks and typing the mobile number and trying to see if there is a login. Okay. Mm. So exactly the same kind of vulnerability that you do on an automated fashion. In India, automation is human beings. So the way in which it works is that uh, you get an army of people to work for you and uh, they do phishing on an automated fashion, if you call human, like a script. Okay. And there is a percentage commission that is being offered and so on and so on. So this is one kind of attack that I've seen. Uh, uh, to be very honest, we don't know how to defend against it. I mean, neither do cops have any idea about it, nor do the uh, cybercrime unit have any idea about it. And it's kind of very bizarre uh, that these attacks keep happening uh, through apps, um, uh, not through bank regular OTP schemes. So the, the thing has evolved in the last one or two years, as you can see, it is, Earlier, it used to be the debit card scams, like the readers and the credit card scams uh, without the uh, chip-based attacks. I mean, it used to be pretty common. Mo we see a, a cyber phishing attack, uh, cyber attacks mostly not uh, on the phishing side as, as I've wanted quite a bit in the last uh, two years. But there is one other thing that I want to uh, point out. Uh, 
it is we have also seen a lot of cases where uh, account takeover happens by putting a trojan on the victim's device uh, through what is called as a uh, media assisted mediation service i mean you can laugh about it so the way in which it works in india is that most of the people don't understand cyber i mean particularly the set of people who are coming to upi so someone installs all these apps on their devices and gives it to them and uh, it it so happens that most of the people who install these apps is your village uh, or your town district guy whom everyone th- talks is the it guy and i and you would be surprised to know how many of those people actually install viral uh, and racks on their android devices so some of the vulnerability that you are actually showing up is not theoretical at all i mean it is deadly practical and i've also seen cases where uh, paytm was worried about these uh, malware to such an extent that uh, they actually when the application starts they actually have a list of blacklisted apps which includes team viewer and the whole bunch of uh, these things and they don't actually start until uh, this thing comes up so you can see a, you can see a basic uh, problem here in the sense that you are trying to do a banking transaction on what is fundamentally an insecure device to i mean android being android and then we also see a large number of uh, pre installed android uh, stuff that is coming all over and which has pre installed apps you have no idea what those guys are doing about it and so most of the attack vectors that you say are uh, the people come and tell me are uh, something that is theoretical i'm seeing it on the on the public domain a lot uh, uh, stuff like accessibility service being compromised i mean we have at least tracked about five different rats uh, which are stealing credentials Uh, in the thousand odd cases i've seen you can question them as a sample but again th- think about the bias that i'm seeing uh, not many people report so my thousand sample is is or a 7000 sample is a very small sample but it is representative in the sense that these are complaints that are actually come up hmm. okay so we have to go back and ask about the question uh, that could you think about any better way of securing because that is what everyone is interested at this point of time to be very honest Do you, I mean, do you see a problem in the protocol, or do you see a problem in the implementation, or do you see a problem in the way in which the NTC library is written? I mean, so we have to write it down and think slightly bigger and see which are the uh, mitigation measures. Uh, I mean, I understand they are very hostile and all that. I mean, that is basically how the DNA of the organization is. But that doesn't mean that we can evolve something outside of it. And then so, uh, let, let me let me chime in a little bit on that. Um, so I think the step that would really help is uh, so if uh, npci were to at least present the logical design of the client side authentication mechanism so it doesn't i mean even if they kind of you know have some um, reservations about publishing the exact details i think a logical design would still help because you can then analyze the logical design from a security perspective and say okay um, assuming the implementation is correct of that logical design what guarantees does it provide and what does it stand on so for example does it now uh, from the news in the while it seems like um uh, from what you're saying is uh, that uh, apparently they're able to set up a upi app on a different phone than the victims without yeah. having the corresponding sim card yeah. loaned for example right correct and now that kind of goes against the um i think the claims that npci makes about the protocol uh, like i think what they're saying is that well you know um, like in our case we discovered this alternate workflow uh, but that's been closed now the question still remains that have uh, have somehow uh, others have found workflows that even we are not aware of at this mm-hmm. point right um, because i mean hackers reverse engineer you know it's not just security researchers And yeah, yeah, so, but there's a significant so difference here. Open questions. Uh, the significant is difference is these are not hackers. Uh, so that is basically what I was coming to the organization part. Uh, these are eight uh, hundred passouts uh, in UP. Okay. No, the, have... the, yeah, I agree. The the people who are running the show are that, but they Correct. might have, uh, you know, somewhere uh, on the black market, and you know, uh, sort of deep net. You know, the information gets shared. Correct. Uh, in There's of, also a YouTube uh, channel for it with support networks. Yeah. So, and we don't know. I mean, I think the problem is that. So, so I mean, we are talking to NPCI. Uh, so at least now, I think for our research group, we have some high-level contacts 
at NPCI security team. And we intend to follow up with them kind of uh, to at least sensitize to potential concerns. And I think I'm hope hopeful that they'll be receptive. Um, you had a good dialogue initially over the past week uh, with them. Uh, so that's a good sign. I think the change that kind of, I think is required a little bit uh, from posture perspective is that uh, I think companies have to realize and governments have to realize that security, like absolute security is not possible in general, right? So it always stands on assumptions and it's a moving target in terms of what the attacker's capability are. But at least kind of have be open to um, input and engage with the research community to help improve the protocols essentially. And I mean, vulnerabilities get found in every product out there. Um, nothing is 100% secure. Everything stands on assumptions. Uh, it's just a question of how hard is it to break the assumptions at the end of the day? And I think you've got to be realistic on that front that, um, you know, so if Android has weaknesses, you've got to recognize that in the design uh, of the protocol. And um, one thing like, for example, I'm kind of hoping for is that the protocol provides some end-to-end -end security, something that's like, you know, rather than something with multiple hops. Uh, in between where, for example, down the road, for example, if a PSP gets compromised or an employee at a PSP, uh, you know, uh, gets compromised, um, they're not able to do damage uh, without uh, something from the user. But that's kind of, we don't know the details. I think that's the problem that we don't know the uh, design of the protocol. On the E2E part, uh, this is something I found interesting recently, UPS specification, the 1.0 specs. Uh, the way they were implemented, they actually implemented some little form of E2E in the sense that uh, the final pens, the M pens themselves, and anything else that was encrypted by the common library specifically to be sent to the bank. So in this case, for example, the OTPs for the debit card resets, they were encrypted using the fine issuing bank uh, keys. However, the design has changed since because it makes it harder E2E, E2E implementation. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that would be a good thing. Implement. So uh, PCI, uh, yeah. Yeah. They so went back the, from that. Yeah, that would be a good change. So if the bank is issuing some sort of uh, secret, like an OTP, and is going to the user's device, bypassing the PSP, and on the response back, also the PSP doesn't get to see it because it's encrypted. You know that. So these are the kind of things that need to be done. But and it would really be nice to see a logical design of the protocol. Uh, not necessarily the implementation, uh, so you don't need a detailed uh, walkthrough through every message, you know, format if they're worried about potential hacks, uh, but the design would be useful so that it can be kind of vetted, I think, from a security perspective and possible tweaks made over time, I think. Uh, uh, so that's the main change I think I would like to see, you know, and I think uh, government has some track record in this. Like uh, Arogya Setu, I think I was really pleased to see at least the client side code was published on GitHub, uh, so that uh, people perhaps concerned about privacy could be more, you know, assured. Although there's still a question, you know, the server side, we don't know what the server side is going to do uh, once it gets the information. So uh, they're still there, but that, I mean, so th there is at least some recognition that perhaps making it open can assure people of uh, that uh, the information is safe, uh, I think. And that I think would be a good step to see. I mean, the, the, so that, that is one. The next thing that I want to actually point out uh, to Vimka is that the organizational the cyber posture, uh, at least in our experience, uh, has been an institutional kind of a policy response. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can't build a cybersecurity posture unless until the institutionally uh, there is some recognition that they have to build something. I mean, the saying that we have in cyber is all offense is technical, but all defense is political. I mean, in a way of saying that it is basically a bureaucratic setup that you need on your side uh, to come back and say that, look, we are responding in a certain way in that, right? Uh, what has been your experience uh, on the bureaucratic side both of you, since you involved with it? I mean, see, just like how I explained to you that attackers also have a bureaucracy. I mean, like I explained to you the portfolio approach, there is basically a group, there is a target, there is a project manager. That's how the, uh, the matrix is built, right? And uh, what we also want to know is any successful uh, cybersecurity posture 
requires an organization and bureaucracy on the defense side. And that's fundamentally a political decision. I mean, I say political, not political party kind of a decision. I, it's I essentially guess, an organizational, political kind of a decision. Do you see a better cyber posture as you had been engaging with them for a while? Yeah, I understand your question. It's a tricky question to answer, though. Uh, so but precisely for the bureaucracy part, part of it, let me say that, too. Uh, but I think in general, uh, I would want uh, Indian vendors, app vendors to be a little bit more receptive to disclosures. Um, and I think uh, engaging with them has been pretty difficult in the last three years, I would say. And I think sometimes it's um, you know, the responses are borderline, you know, uh, very, very uh, defensive responses. And I think they're not even willing to read our disclosures at some points. So I would expect, I think, companies to consider disclosures as a way to improve their product offerings, um, as opposed to thinking that someone is pointing fingers at them, for instance. So in general, I think the responses that I've gotten from pretty much everybody except Samsung was a little bit of a disappointment in that sense. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Atul, do you have any other take on it? Uh, no, I think, I think that's about right. I think the, the problem is that if you think of a vulnerability report as um, a negative knock, Yeah. Right. And management then thinks, ah, okay, so my product is not secure and I'm going to get, you know, uh, negative uh, feedback from my boss. Uh, you know, that's a problem because then you will, you know, the tendency would be to push back on the report and not perhaps even engage with the people because, I mean, uh, or, I mean, we've seen a case where, uh, you know, Renuka was trying to uh, publish a vulnerability report, report it to the vendor. They said, no, um, it's not a true vulnerability or whatever, um, okay. And then she was trying to get it published publicly. So she said, okay, if there's not a true vulnerability, maybe I can put it out publicly. And at that point they uh, threatened uh, with a lawsuit that, uh, that uh, this is really serious. Uh, you should not put it out publicly. Uh, so it was like trying to have it both ways. Um, uh, and that's like a problem if you, you know, from a research perspective, I mean, we are researchers. And our goal is to help these companies secure their products before somebody else exploits them and improve the design. That's what we're trying to do. And I think a little more thank you would be helpful uh, <laughs> to people who are trying to- Yeah, because uh, it is the same thing that I actually get from uh, the law enforcement side also, uh, because yeah. uh, they don't actually respond to anything. None of the companies respond to anything. Uh, the only thing, unfortunately, they can do is send a bunch of notices, but uh, what good is a notice uh, for a cop who's not as sophisticated as you and Renuka? I mean, they yeah, so I think the change thing. in you the process you're a... asking for would be that uh, maybe instructing the defense side, the people who are responsible for security of these products, to first always thank the people who are acknowledge and thank the people who are uh, reporting vulnerabilities, whether the vulnerability they agree or disagree and really engage in a dialogue and then also notify the people when the issue has been closed. Uh, and at that point then, um, you know, and there, there should be a, like a, maybe a three month window, uh, you know, or a one month window for you to address the vulnerability. And after that, people are reporting it should be free to uh, make it public at that point, right? Unless there's a really, really serious vulnerability, acknowledged vulnerability, which takes more time to fix. Uh, but kind of set that process so that researchers can have a, uh, you know, can do a responsible disclosure at some point and get credit. Uh, and yet the defense side also uh, is encouraging more of that feedback loop because nobody can make systems secure uh, completely. And, uh, you know, I mean, there are a lot of clever people around who will find loopholes if, they, if there's money to be made. I think that's the issue. Okay. I want to say point out two things. One is that when you mentioned bureaucracy, it's not just bureaucracy of one central organization. In this case, if you want to report vulnerabilities, now there are 155 applica UP applications that you need to ensure are secure. So it's not just a one centralized vendor in this case. There are hundreds of different vendors 
who all need to have their own vulnerability disclosure process. And I think this is where NTT can really step up and say, for example, they already have certain set of guidelines that a lot of these apps need to follow. They need to follow a pen test cycle, for example, uh, for every major release. Uh, yeah. they all, they I, yeah. So I think what I would, I mean, one, one, yeah. one thing to start, uh, I think, you know, I think your group can probably do that research is find a list of vulnerabilities that each product has listed on their website in the past. Okay. If you go to Google or every other product in the outside the world, right outside in the US or anything, you will see vulnerability disclosures on Android on every other system. Now take a look at the Indian apps, right? And if you see zero, in the past, that means the process is probably not right. Okay, every product should have some vulnerabilities in the past. Like it's very unlikely that nothing, you know, something was designed with security right from scratch. Okay, so yeah. So if something claims to have zero vulnerability in the last three years, probably the process, is, reporting process is broken is what I would argue, you know, and that may require a fix. It's, it's not a negative, to have some vulnerabilities. What's negative is not to acknowledge them and uh, not to uh, let people know that you have a process for uh, reporting. Okay, uh, Srikan, I have nothing more. Okay, Nimo, you said a couple of things, right? Just, you know, one. Yeah, just uh, like uh, uh, a lot of these different banks are really, really small scale. And all of these have been have the exact same level of access to UPI as any large bank. And clearly, from what we know, uh, the security posture that these banks have is not exactly the same as, for example, that an HDFC would have. Uh, and this is, I believe, a call for concern in this case because it, it. I mean, uh, it's it's uh, like two things. One is that I may have. from what I what I understand, NPCI releases a client and server side library to each of these banks, and may be doing some betting of each of these PSPs code. I think they do some internal checks from what I'm told. And I mean, but you're still right that um, there are 155 uh, versions of these. And many of these I think would be variants of Beam, for example, uh, in some cases, because what happens is that Beam would lend its kind of app in some sense to for labeling to individual banks in India, like especially the public sector banks. Uh, so we've seen some examples of that. And um, so, so the total number that need to be analyzed could be smaller, we don't know. Uh, because again, um, without yeah. code, it's hard. And especially it's all of us get it code at this point. So, but yeah, from a hacker perspective, they don't have to break um, all of them. They just have to find one of them that's weak. And that, that's, I think still remains a challenge. That's mostly it from me. I think. Okay, there was uh, one audience question probably on one of these slides. Uh, the question is Mali can only retrieve the passcode if it has draw on top permissions in Android. These are hard to provide. Uh, so uh, the exploit that we do does not require any additional permissions and the paper actually talks about which CV we are exploiting. So um, in that case, uh, you know, Mali only required internet permission, which is basically a normal permission and uh, the SMS, receive SMS permission to pretty much intercept the OTP, but we did not require any permissions for uh, intercepting the passcode. Uh, oh, our initial okay. attacks, um, go ahead Dr. Tru. Yeah, Renuka, uh, also um, maybe just pointing out to the audience that um, in Android, you know, besides the sort of the subtle way of capturing user input that uh, Renuka is referring to, that kind of is pretty technical. Uh, but it turns out that uh, on Android, there's also a permission called accessibility. And often yeah. people will, you know, apps will request that and users will grant that permission called accessibility. And Renuka, you can correct me, uh, but accessibility also gives a way to capture user input as well, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So in almost all the cases, uh, all the apps we've looked at, we've been able to uh, you know, intercept pretty much uh, anything entered on the form on the screen, except for Samsung Pay, because they require, uh, they use internally use the 
uh, TEE based mechanism to you know uh, restrict access to their pin entry screen, but except for Samsung Pay, I think everybody, every other app, pretty much we found a way to uh, intercept either through accessibility or toast overlays, for instance. Okay, see, probably want to add something, and let's see. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I saw that actually. I think I, I'm not sure if he is uh, able to talk. I mean, he didn't. I don't know if he's joined here. But he yeah, essentially he's saying the same thing. He's saying that we use the toast overlay vulnerability to draw our other apps. That does not require additional permissions. Yeah. So just to kind of uh, explain that a little bit more. So basically, in Android, it's possible. Um, you know, at least in the versions we tested earlier um, was for a background app to overlay the screen with a screen of, you know, and make it look like anything you like. So essentially, for example, if the uh, a banking app is coming up with a screen to request a user ID and a password or something like that, uh, or a pin, um, if the uh, background app can figure out that that screen is going to get launched uh, and there are ways of doing that, then it can launch a similar screen uh, to overlay that and capture the input. So that's like one, one method of uh, stealing uh, user input uh, that was uh, uh, an issue. And that's been reported to Android as well. And I think they made it harder over time to capture that, but it's still, I think at least last time we checked, it was possible uh, about a year ago. Okay, we'll wait for a few more minutes for any other questions and I have a few comments to make. I'll make them briefly. Uh, so one is on the uh, differential uh, level of access to uh, the infrastructure that Nemo was talking about. Uh, there are banks having different capabilities, uh, all having the share of the same infrastructure and same level of access. That is something to worry about. And uh, uh, the, uh, so that point is not clear to me, at least. So, uh, so uh, to, to expand a bit on that, uh, what Nemo was saying is essentially in UPI, uh, there are like uh, uh, 150 banks that act as issuer and all these banks, uh, and these are not apps, these are banks which are connected to the UPI system over uh, which any of these apps can operate. And these banks have varying level of IT maturity levels, uh, I mean, the, what is uh, same uh, seen as an investment in, in cybersecurity by, uh, say, a, a top public sector bank or a top private sector bank might not be the same case with, say, a regional rural bank. Uh, and uh, all of them having the same degree of access uh, to the UPI infrastructure uh, is, is a cause of worry. And uh, to your point, sir, on uh, banks letting know the user, I think there is one uh, scenario at least where there is a notification that comes up uh, with ICICI banks that if you try to register UPI with uh, any app, uh, ICICI from its own end sends an SMS notification to the user saying that, hey, you are using, uh, or you or somebody else is trying to register you on a UPI uh, using this particular app, and that kind of gives the user an independent confirmation that at least some activity is going on. And yeah. stretching on that, uh, several banks already put in place some kind of issuer limits on withdrawals, and uh, and these should be far more user customizable. So, uh, like in the case of cards, we do have. Uh, an RBI mandate which says that users should be allowed uh, to set their own toggles, which is on international usage, online usage, uh, cash withdrawal and ATM and so on. Similar toggles, which is for U UPI, should also be uh, made available uh, in the sense that uh, I want to use UPI, but uh, the max that I would spend on UPI is probably like only 5,000 rupees. And that should, uh, and that, threshold should be configurable by the user and that kind of goes away at least takes the monetary risk out of the system even even if the system is compromised and, and such efforts could kind of uh, mitigate in a practical sense though not uh, in a theoretical and technical sense the risks but at a practical uh, sense from loss of money uh, I mean the, the scenario of emptying the bank accounts can't happen if, if such a 
uh, thing where to exit. And I, I think there are some banks which kind of do these uh, threshold sets, but these are not standardized and these have to kind of be made as a regulatory mandate and followed across the system. And this is where uh, the variance between the UPI uh, ecosystem uh, and, and the multiple banks comes in, where different banks kind of treat, uh, uh, have their own rules. Uh, some banks are slightly uh, easier on the uh, these restrictions. Some banks are like harder, so harder that uh, it becomes tough to, to use. Uh, but yeah, these kind of configurable uh, threshold limits uh, I would say would go in some way to kind of prevent uh, the after effects from a monetary side, though not from a technical side. Uh, yeah, and, the, and these have to be out of band because if they're in band in the system, then the hacker can also change them. So these have to be set out of band. And I mean, we... Right. Uh, you know, that's another important thing, right? I mean, it has to be directly between the bank and the customer, not through UPI. Uh, these uh, I think uh, uh, on a related note, uh, there is a recent mandate, I'm not 100% sure on this, which is that any, if you register with a new PSP today, you're only allowed to transfer or withdraw money to the tune of 5,000 for the first day over UPI. Uh, I've seen it implemented across apps, and I think it's a generalized mandate, I'm not 100% sure on this. Yeah, I mean, that would be good. I mean, the other possibility would be, uh, another possible design could be, could be uh, to kind of escrow the money, you know, you know for a, you know some period of time uh, when there's a transfer, so that there's a chance to back out, or if if the bank like request the bank if it was unauthorized, um, um, so so the money uh, because the uh, so the money isn't transferred immediately and then withdrawn, and then you know it disappears. So there's a chance to kind of do you know s slow down the uh, transfer a little bit, um, and you know if it's for especially for larger transactions. Um, um, so that could be another step that they could take. Okay, there is one question from YouTube uh, from a person called Security Geek. Uh, want to know about the payment gateway service provider has more loopholes, how to overcome this issue. If anyone reports they are not properly responding and not able to comprehend the question fully. But broadly, I think it's, it's on... Uh, Payment gateway service provider having loopholes. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe Nemo, can you add uh, anything specific uh, along these lines or any attack vectors on gateway service providers? Uh, all I can say is like uh, payment gateways also have vulnerabilities. And if you'd like to report them, the payment gateways should have a vulnerability disclosure process. Uh, and I don't think it's in the current draft guidelines that in the, the current guidelines that RBI has written for payment gateways, but I'm sure it can be implemented. So is, is he asking about, uh, you know, uh, vulnerability disclosures or is he talking about fraud, fraud reporting? Like uh, I've seen that a lot of these uh, uh, vendors don't necessarily have proper fraud reporting process. So I'm not sure what he's referring to. Is he referring to the uh, technical vulnerabilities or, uh, you know, fraud reporting? Yeah, the question is kind of vague. Ambiguous, right? Yeah. So I've actually gone through a lot of these websites to see if there's a fraud reporting process and I've not really seen a clear cut way for users to report fraud in case their account is compromised. And Google Pay has their own, you know, a purely email based mechanism. NPC, I think has a toll free number or something like that. So they vary in their uh, fraud reporting process. So I'm not so, really sure. I mean, one, one thing I... I also good, I mean, if you're looking at larger issues beyond technical side, um, it would be good to look at the legal side of it, like liability side of it. Like for example, if a fraudulent transaction takes place through you, through a UPI app, um, you know, I think, you know, it's a question of who, you know, is there any protection for the consumer in terms of, and uh, from uh, the bank or from NPCI? And uh, or do they end up disclaiming any liability? So ideally, if the, if the claim is from NPCI that the app cannot simply be set up on a phone without the SIM card, then it would be nice to have that, okay, you know, kind of something along the line that we assume liability if a transaction takes place 
from an unregistered phone uh, that was not, uh, that is like provably doesn't have the SIM card in it. Uh, right, so I haven't seen that yet. So, I mean, something like that would be nice because I mean, presumably banks can keep logs of uh, when transactions are requested, they know potentially, uh, you know, the uh, uh, device information from which the transaction was issued. And it can probably be verified by the phone company uh, that uh, whether a SIM card was actually used in that uh, particular device with a particular IMI number. And so there is, I think, um, at the message level, at the server side, there is probably information to figure out if the uh, somehow uh, you can um, and maybe you know automating that would be useful. Uh, and in that case, uh, it would be nice if uh, consumer is not held liable uh, for the loss. Okay, another question from me to Renika would be that. Uh... Like, have you studied any other apps, uh, I mean, be it Indian or otherwise, uh, or be it payment or otherwise, which kind of does uh, this kind of device binding? And are there any alternate approaches, particularly on verifying the consumer identity? I mean, it need not necessarily be for payment or uh, so, but uh, are there any other alternate ways on a device binding uh, that you've seen in the other apps implement? Yeah, actually I haven't, uh, at least in the apps that I've looked at, uh, I've not studied many, many US-based apps and maybe Dr. Atul can uh, you know, tell me if there's device binding in that, but I've not studied from a workflow perspective, not any of the US-based apps, but I've only seen so far uh, this mechanism, the send SMS based mechanism, mostly in Indian apps. Um, I think a lot of the other places typically use OTP-based verification. And um, um, I'm not even sure if they use this uh, shared secret even there. I am not fond of using, personally not using uh, any of the mobile apps on my phone ever since I started this research on mobile payments. I don't use any payment apps, essentially. Although, um, Renuka, you may not be safe because remember that uh, hackers can... Uh, set up UPI without you being a UPI that user. That is true. That is <laughs> that, that is true. That's so, not a good. <laughs> yeah, that is true. So, so, uh, so yeah. So I mean, I can say a little bit. Like I use Venmo, for example, in uh, and I've used a few others like um, PayPal uh, because just because I have to pay people, uh, especially these days, um, you know, where you can't, uh, you know, you want to avoid cash. Um, um, so like, you know, person who does my gardening, I, uh, you know, he has uh, PayPal. So I send my PayPal on that. And that's, that is linked to my bank account. So, and there is kind of this uh, latent worry that, okay, uh, could my bank account be empty, uh, you know, if uh, somehow my PayPal account is compromised. So you sort of go through uh, multiple things, like of course, having, um, uh, you know, two-factor authentication every time I log in into PayPal, I think the app requires that. Uh, in general, um, you know, you can question the security of that, whether it's completely secure. Uh, but in terms of how the account was added, I think there were two things that they required at that time in US. This is for the US system. And, you know, the threat profile might be different here compared to India. And, um, uh, but they required either logging in, I, as I recall, directly to your bank, um, and um, somehow I think they had some arrangement with the banks directly. So, um, um, and I forget whether it was PayPal or Venmo, but I've seen that. And second method, if you didn't want to do that, because I was, you know, if you're hesitant, hesitant to put your user ID and password and log into a bank site, because hey, that could be spoofed too. Um, then uh, the second solution was to, that they would on the back end do a small transaction. So they would deposit uh, like, uh, five cents and 10 cents, uh, you know, and then withdraw 15 cents back, kind of do a small transaction, which they're probably authorized by the banks to be able to do uh, on behalf of the user. Um, and then the user would have to confirm those amounts uh, by logging in uh, directly to the bank through a side channel, uh, like uh, through a second channel, like uh, on, your web, on your bank's website, uh, say from a desktop. 
So, so that's kind of done. And I've seen ICICI do that for uh, like, if they're trying to, uh, if you're trying to enable money transfer from US bank account to India, then for authenticating the US bank account that you possess it, that's how they today do it. So, um, and you could argue that's like more end to end and therefore perhaps preferred to just relying on device security alone. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I could do Especially that. Kind of the simple thing would be to, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would also like think this a uh, simple thing would be to simply even, you know, have a bank uh, secret that's shared with the bank, for instance, right? Like device binding, if it's the most critical step of the protocol, uh, I, would, I would think at that point that, you know, there's something that's uh, shared with the bank. And I think that essentially is not there. So it could it could require that the user goes to the bank explicitly to verify uh, the first time, for instance, or or when they change their phone, that it requires an additional step for security reasons, maybe even visit a bank. So, or an ATM for that matter, uh, and have some mechanism where the user can um, ascertain or validate to the bank that they're actually asking for a rebinding or a binding. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that we su suggested that in the paper that uh, initial setup would be that maybe requires a visit to the bank where they can verify your IDs, for example, uh, or a change of phone might require that. Uh, but once you're authenticated, maybe the friction could be less to make it easy. Uh, yeah. So, but, uh, but, the, but I think the larger point is one should assume that some phones are going to get compromised and really think about cutting down the risks and uh, look at the larger process beyond the protocol itself uh, to um, understand uh, and limit the risks. And I mean, and the changes could be at the UI level. So for example, one of the things that NPCI just uh, told me, uh, you know, I said, well, you know, is it safe for my parents now to use UPI? Can I tell them that? You know, given that uh, you know you're telling me that you fixed all the issues uh, finally that uh, we reported to you, and they said yes, um, as long as uh, you know pe people remember that they don't enter a UPI pin when they're asked that when they're told that they'll be receiving money. So UPI pin only is required for withdrawal. So as long as you never enter UPI pin, um, if you're only receiving money and not sending money, then one should be safe. Um, well, uh, the thing is though that, okay, so if that's the issue for one kind of fraud, not the kind of fraud that we, you know, kind of problem that we discovered, uh, but um, even if UPI is completely secure and this is a point of vulnerability from a usage perspective, then the question is how to change the UI, for example, uh, can the UI be made better? And can you do some user studies to see if that cuts down frauds? Uh, fraud at that point, like improving the UI. So I think that the, that, uh, that is a larger process. It's not a protocol issue, uh, but it does impact security uh, of people and uh, cutting down the risks. Yeah, uh, there are quite a bit of uh, just collect requests, on. masquerading um, as sent requests. I see. Yeah, quite a bit of it. So what happens is uh, there are different kinds of things uh, that I've seen. Uh, one is that Someone basically tells you that uh, uh, they want to send you money, but in reality, they send you a link which withdraws money from your bank account. People fall for it all the time. Mm. It's called as a it's called as a directional scam. Mm. In the sense yeah. that they tell you that it is one direction, but in reverse, the link is another direction. Mm. The payment gateway uh, link problems is fundamentally that, which is uh, instead of sending you money, they send you a link which takes money from your UPI. Quite common on the world. Yeah, but I think uh, what I'm told is that if, if the money is to be withdrawn, you have to enter a PIN uh, from your account. And I think what they were saying is that if somehow users can be educated on that part, that might help. Uh, that uh, if somebody promises to send you money, then you will not have to enter a PIN to receive the money. That's what NPCI, uh, you know. It's not what is happening in the real world. So, that is no, so in the real world, what happens is that the message that you get is a little confusing because see the message below the uh, payment thing can, is controlled by the uh, attacker yes. and they can say you will be receiving money Correct. if you click here, right? And that's not controlled by the bank. Correct. Or 
uh, in this case, that money is going to be withdrawn from your account. So, and people, you know, so essentially they need to do user studies with, with, um, uh, uh, with uh, customers to see in the case of these crafted uh, requests, are people able to disambiguate, whether it's a, re a request for receiving money or sending money. And they can do that over Amazon Turk, for example, a lot of ways to do these kind of studies, um, you know, to assess how the UI should be designed so that people are less um, susceptible to uh, these kind of messages. Um, but I'm not sure that that's being done. And I mean, that, that could be something that you know, NPCI could fund universities to do, for example, um, uh, you know, and, and that these are easy things to do, like kind of low hanging fruits for uh, securing the app further. Also want to point out that, you know, just having the messaging change is not sufficient because if I, if a normal application, for example, asks the users to set a four digit pen or a six digit pen saying, hey, it's my application pen and you will use it to unlock WhatsApp premium or something like that. Uh, people will typically type their, their common, uh, they'll reuse their UPI pen everywhere. Uh, you ask them for three pens. Yeah, uh, they, yeah, they it's going to be the same pen everything, for everything, yeah, you're right. And on top of that, uh, uh, there was there's research previously published on the usage of common pens across the world. And just by using, I believe, 66 pens, uh, you get to cross 33% of all used uh, pens in previous data sets. So you don't even need that many attempts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, it, like security is really, really hard because, um, you know, I mean, a small thing like that. Okay, so how many retries are allowed for these pins? If, if it's somehow the hackers can figure out a way to get unlimited tries, then uh, the pin can be broken. And so it's really, really hard without um, the uh, details being there um, in some sense. And, um, and testing is really hard. So uh, it really requires, I think, I mean, that's why in research community, we kind of tend to avoid relying on security by obscurity um, because then bugs remain. And that's like a um, problem from that perspective. So obscurity is only good for keys, I would say. Like if you're, if you're relying on uh, some secret keys, fine, that's part of the security. Uh, but the design itself should be not opaque um, because otherwise you get surprises. So two questions, I will just make it. So I can tell you the DNA in general, security by obscurity, is fundamentally a defense mechanism uh, for the imposter syndrome of not being looking very competent. Okay, uh, That's been my observation for quite some time. Uh, so they're just, they're just too worried of being called out as weirds. So that's the reason why they do the security by obscurity. Okay, so that is one thing. The second thing I'm most interested uh, is in the patching part of uh, patching the attacker uh, app, Rimikwa. Okay, uh, so when I when I did the other research, um, most of the wild applications that I saw on the wild was basically about patching the enrollment software. So they patched the hell out of everything. They just ran a completely different Java app for enrolling people, uh, which was not what the UID released. So when when you when you point me out that an attacker can use a patched app, what's the automation scale that you think you can get out of it? I mean, so do they do any kind of distribution checks? One of the things that I've seen applications do is uh, they have a distribution channel, uh, they start self-check and then compare uh, with the key uh, of the signed app. Do they do any kind of stuff? Your research touched on that, but it seems to me that, uh, do they do any kind of verification of the client side app on the server side? Yeah, so Beam didn't do it initially, uh, but uh, Beam does it now. So similar, similarly, I think Paytm didn't do it initially, but I think in the last year when we tried it again, Paytm does do a, a, a server-side check on the integrity of the app. But that said, there are quite a few of these payment apps, I think out there still that don't really have this check in the back. back. So it's still, you can still patch it, you can still repackage it. And then, you know, you can, I can still intercept things out of the app. So the thing is that this is not something that NPCI would mandate, right? So in the sense that they, or they might have some instructions to PSPs, but it's really, I think from NPCI perspective, this is an issue between your PSP and the customer. Unfortunately, it impacts the overall security. I think that's the issue yeah. that you can't mm -hmm. 
Uh, they don't right. have any guidelines on that. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I'm sure they, I mean, I don't know if they have, they, yeah. they, they probably have some guidelines, yeah. but yeah. 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 yeah, but it's not like to the technical depth that would necessarily guarantee uh, that uh, packaging. I mean, and there's really no way to be 100% sure that repackaging is not possible, right? Because if you're relying on code obfuscation, which is usually the strategy, um, so essentially uh, you take a, you know, uh, Android app and you, they probably require the PSPs to obfuscate the code as much as possible. So it's hard to reverse engineer, but ultimately um, those are moving targets and better reverse engineering tools are more, you know, might be able to cause a repackaging. Yeah, and, yeah the reason why I'm asking is uh, with the NSA or Gidra tool, I see mm. quite a bit of popularity on reverse engineering, even on uh, native C, C++ code on Android and iOS. Yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously there has been a flood of uh, uh, reverse engineered iOS vulnerabilities, which once upon a time was thought pretty secure. So things are changing very remarkably on the reverse engineering side. Yeah. And in, in fact, I would probably argue, uh, I want to hear your opinion on that. Uh, if you think that uh, a client side app is pretty much open source, uh, from a reverse engineer's point of view, except maybe a bunch of secrets. Well, I, I mean, yeah, uh, it's probably not complete, you know, it's not like open source at this point, but um, it could be, see, the thing is that what hackers could do is they could try to roll back the operating system version, correct. Uh, uh, right? And they could try to roll back the app version also uh, and try to see if the previous old versions were vulnerable. That would still give clues because the protocols don't change um, drastically. Uh, over time, and so um, so many ways of trying to uh, get to uh, an understanding of a protocol that's pure. So ideally, um, you know, it would be good if, if if the assumptions are clear. So, for example, if the assumption is that, um, so so I mean, relying on hardware security, for example, is one strategy. I mean, Samsung appears to try to do that with their T, for example, or relying on presence of the SIM card, the hardware SIM card um, is another strategy that, okay, that's a building block that you can sort of build on. So as long as that's not compromised somehow, uh, you get some guarantees. Um, and, but then kind of, I think acknowledging that there's still risks because, he, you know, as you mentioned that uh, maybe the Android, you know, people might install um, Trojan apps, um, which have even more permissions than Mali does. Uh, either through other part, you know, third party stores and other things. Um, then you have to look at cutting risks um, that if somehow the UPI app on the user device compromised or secrets can be stolen or it can be instructed uh, to do other transactions uh, from a Trojan app, then uh, how to cut the risk at the server side. So I think um, it's, really hard and you really have to look at the whole process, not just the protocol uh, to uh, sort of comprehend the risks, kind of realizing that each step could potentially be bypassed uh, with some effort. Okay, yeah. we are uh, running out of time. Probably one last question to Professor Atul from Suhan Mukherjee on YouTube. Uh, is the recommendation by Dr. Atul to have a logical design for liability under law, uh, which can then encourage a logical design for security? Reference the example he gave of the app working on an unregistered phone without a SIM. Therefore, we make very specific pointed reference to when, how, and who is liable in different fact situations. Yeah, I mean, that would be nice if there was a linkage there that, okay, that uh, a very clear statement that, so see, see from a customer point of view, they, do, do, they would not distinguish between the bank or the PSP, the bank and UPI, right? To, uh, or an NPCI for that matter, right? So see there are multiple parties involved uh, in this whole transaction. From a customer perspective, that should not really matter. And if their bank offers a service where they have a relationship. It seems like from a customer end, um, you know, they, that's the right point uh, to seek redress, but I'm not sure the laws necessarily or the legal guarantees that the, the apps provide 
give you that protection. I, I mean, it's worth reading uh, the uh, what you sign when you install these apps, uh, what the guarantees are. Uh, what, and I think they're pretty minimal at this point. Um, in US, we have more protection, I believe. Most of the banks will, you know, if there's a fraudulent activity on your account, uh, they assume liability in most cases. Uh, they don't try to fight it. Um, they kind of assume the customer is right in some sense and just take it as part of the loss of, you know, of uh, sort of annual uh, risk that they take in providing the service. Um, but I think the posture in India is not quite there in that sense. But yeah, so one step could be kind of laying out when banks are willing to assume liability uh, in what situations and having some way of um, kind of uh, for them to do that. And if it turns out the liability, you know, how much, you know, it would be nice how much, you know, kind of having some information, public information from at least public sector banks and maybe even private banks requiring RBI to uh, have banks report on how much customers were compensated uh, each year because of this. And I think, again, I would be suspicious if the amount is zero. Uh, that means that uh, policies aren't in favor of the customer in that case. Um, and yeah, I think I would... we broadly have a regulation on limited liability uh, cutting across payment channels. But I think what UPA adds there is just adding more layers because there are more new parties and Within that ecosystem, you need to have a fine-grained uh, responsibilities between each of these players. So, uh, yeah, you, you, I mean that could be right, but I think from a customer point of view, customer doesn't want to get into fights with three entities, right? And they would each disclaim their own. It becomes very hard. So I think from a customer point of view, the interface should be simple. <clears throat> you know, you sort of get your money back uh, within a reasonable period, and uh, if uh, you know, fraud happens. And then I think it's uh, for the parties to decide how they want to structure their private agreements between themselves, bank, NPCI, and uh, the PSP. I, I think the PSP is probably owned by the bank. Oh, no, it's not owned by the bank, right? It's a third party, right? So uh, there are, again, multiple gradations there. So. Uh... Yeah. There are bank-owned PSPs, there are third-party application providers, all sorts of acronyms that come over. Yeah, but the liability structure isn't clear. And I would say, like, I mean, if I'm installing a phone pay app, uh, for example, or a Beam app, and then transacting with uh, possibly another bank, uh, you know, which is obviously not Beam itself, uh, you know, say ICICI, and fraud happens on my account. Um, then who do I go to? Uh, yeah, I, I think we there is uh, an error code mapping that we did uh, or we tried to do uh, on, and this is only at the transaction failures, but not on frauds. But it's probably a similar mapping needs to happen on scenarios for frauds as well, which we kind of exactly. did. And that piece of information has to be public. I mean, even the error codes, uh, something yeah, that, that should be public. collected. Uh, ad hoc and then classified them, but that has to be coming from the official source in PCI. Yeah, so I mean, if NPCI, for example, were to claim that app cannot be set up on a device without your SIM card, then that, for example, could be a point, okay, that they assume liability on that part. If, for example, the vulnerability is not because of that, but because of, uh, the PSP failing to authenticate you properly, uh, not follow the guidelines, then you know they assume liability. And then, if a fraudulent transaction happens in your account, then you know the bank becomes liable. Um, but there's a technical side to it also that perhaps you know there could be a UPI 3.0 down the road, which really should look at sort of the larger issue. Can we sort of somehow do more end-to-end -end security so that um, uh, flaws in the PSP side um, don't necessarily propagate to being able to do transactions uh, with a bank. Um, and I think there are ways to do that. We have some ideas. Um, we have done some work on that in the 
um, uh, in the context of uh, like Internet of Things. So we had a paper on something called IFT, uh, I F F T T T. Uh, so this is kind of a, uh, a protocol uh, that's um, a server that allows you to connect to your internet devices in your home and run commands on them. And we showed how to do that end to end, like how to get some end to end security in that scenario without relying, relying on the cloud provider, cloud service provider. So there are, there are possible ideas in the research community that could influence a future design of these payment protocols. Um, and I think it would be worth a look. Yes. I think with that, we come to a close. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahul. Thank you, Renika, for joining us and presenting your work. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, thanks, Nemo. And thanks, Anand, for your comments. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, do look forward to more such sessions in the future. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, guys.